What is going on, guys? Well, today is a new beginning for the DC movie universe. So if you are not tied into recent events, a few months ago, it was announced that James Gunn and Peter Safran were going to be co-CEOs of a new branch in Warner Brothers called DC Studios that, as the name would lead you to believe, is going to be solely focused on producing and releasing the DC Universe films and television series. Quickly after that, it was alluded to and then pretty much announced that uh, a lot of the previous iterations of characters and stories were not going to be followed, were not going to be continued. This is going to be a fresh restart for the DC Universe. The internet has gone in many different directions discussing this. I personally am excited for it because as much as I love some of the movies that we've gotten from the DC Universe thus far, that universe has been held together by duct tape since its inception. And even if you love it, you cannot argue that. So I am ready for a slate of films underneath a plan. And so today we got our first look at the plan for the next eight to 10 years, at least a part of that plan. They're calling it Chapter One, Gods and Monsters. It was announced through a social media video that James Gunn himself released. And pretty much everything that he said as a creative really excites me for the potential of this universe because he's somebody that has always been a creative person. You know, he started back in the trauma days, has worked his way up into doing massive blockbusters and now being a co-CEO of an entire studio. So the man has put the work in and he is somebody that I trust is going to put the story first, put the characters first, put the creatives first. And he even announced that there's going to be a title or a banner called DC Elseworlds which really excites me. So things like Matt Reeves, the Batman, things like Todd Phillips, the Joker, uh, Teen Titans Go, things that are already in production, as well as presumably a lot of things in the future that don't necessarily fit into the grand universe that they are building out, but are still really awesome stories that they want to tell. They can be told and fit underneath that banner so that they are separate and audiences understand that they're separate. And man, is that exciting? Because as much as I love most of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I am one of those people that's like, come on, can we have some rated R shit every once in a while? Does Deadpool have to be the only one? Do we have to have a PG-13 blade? I think an Elseworlds banner is an absolutely brilliant idea, and I'm probably most excited that they announced that, if anything else. So Batman Part 2 got its release date coming out October 3rd, 2025, I believe. So excited for that. I'm not including that on this list because it would automatically be number one. Uh, and I'm very curious about the Joker part two. I'm not really a musical guy, but I have faith that it's going to be something interesting. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about the 10 new announced projects that they gave. Some of them are films. Some of them are TV series. And I'm going to rank them by my excitement for them. Now, admittedly, a lot of these characters and a lot of these properties that they announced today, I don't have any knowledge of. I don't have any previous experience of. I never read the comic books. And so this is going to be my first introduction to them. And so I hope that even the ones that I have ranked low because of various reasons, when I actually get to see them, I'm hoping I become an instant fan and I'm going to be curious to check out comic books and all the previous stuff. So starting off at number 10, the project that I am least excited about is going to be Creature Commandos. And I'll be honest, and this is a very shallow reason, but I have to give my honest take. Uh, it's just because it's an animated series. I'm not really big into animation stuff. I never watched the Marvel What If. I never watched any of the DC animated movies that have come out. It's just not really my thing. You know, there's great animation out there, but I'm just somebody that I always prefer my stuff live action. I'll watch a three star live action film before I'll watch a five star animated film any day of the week. That's just who I am. So that's pretty much the only reason why it is this low. Now, the description that we were given for Creature Commandos is a seven episode animated series written by Gunn. He wrote every single one of the episodes that is already in production. Originally, a team of classic monsters assembled to fight Nazis. This is a modern take on the concept. The voice actors have yet to be cast, but the executives are looking to find people who can voice the animated characters and also portray the live action versions when the antiheroes show up in movies and series, which is also something really cool that he announced is that they're going to try to make it so consistent that even when they do animated things, animated movies or series or whatever projects, they're going to keep the same actors the same likeness the same voice so that you can literally transition from one to the other and they're all interconnected that does excite me about it because that's one of the reasons 
Of course, somebody's got to drive their fucking monstrous ass engine by when I'm recording, you dick. But that is one of the reasons why I haven't watched any of these animated series or animated movies uh, while there is a movie universe going on is because if it's not the Suicide Squad that I know, why should I give a shit? So that might be one of the bridges that gets me more into this stuff. Uh, now, that was from The Hollywood Reporter. And let me see what Variety says about it. Creature Commandos. Animated series for HBO Max, the very first project greenlit by Saffron and Gunn, who has written every episode, show is already in production, uh, were first launched in 1980. The premise features Frankenstein's monster teaming up with a werewolf, a vampire, and a gorgon to fight Nazis in World War II. I did not realize that it was those classic monsters, so that does raise my interest a little bit, but it's still my least interested. It doesn't appear that Gunn's version takes quite the same approach. Weasel, one of the characters from Gunn's 2021 film The Suicide Squad, is one of the commandos, along with Rick Flagg's father, Rick Flagg Sr., Animation allows their creative collaborators, collaborators to tell stories that are gigantic, but without spending 50 million an episode. Crucially, Gunn said that the actors cast to voice the characters in the show will also play the roles in live action. So the, the fact that they're going to be the same actors is the interesting part to me, as well as the fact that it's Frankenstein's monster and uh, werewolves and all that. stuff. So that, that that is up my alley, but I would rather see that live action. So interesting there's not a single project announced today that i don't have some interest in but that is the one that i'm the least excited about just because i'm a shallow man that doesn't like to watch animation coming in at number nine is going to be waller and this is as the title would let you to believe a show about amanda waller who has been one of the most consistently used characters throughout the scatterbrained DC Universe thus far, portrayed by Viola Davis in both of the Suicide Squad movies. She's also made little cameos and post credit scenes. Uh, she was also in Peacemaker, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure she was. And it says that in a spinoff of Gunn's own HBO Max hit series, Peacemaker, Viola Davis will return as the ruthless and morally ambiguous head of a government task force. It's being written by Crystal Henry, who gave us Watchmen, and Jeremy Carver, the creator of the Doom Patrol TV series. Uh, now for Variety. With Gunn focused on Superman legacy for the foreseeable future, season two of Peacemaker has been put on hold. Instead, Team Peacemaker will appear alongside Davis as a continuation of that show, which, spoiler alert for season one of Peacemaker, ended with Waller's daughter, Leota Adebayo, outing Task Force X and Waller's role running it to the world. Along with Crystal Henry, who is part of the DC Writers Room, Waller will be executive produced by Jeremy Carver, who created Doom Patrol, was recently canceled by HBO Max. Saffron said they are crushing it while working on Waller. It's just the greatest show ever. Gunn added both Creature Commandos and Waller are expected to debut before Superman Legacy. Saffron called them the apertif for the DCU. So uh, I was tempted to put this last just because as much as Viola Davis does a fantastic job in that role, I've never found her to be the most interesting character in any of the projects she has been in. She's just that evil bitch figurehead that keeps popping up. And so maybe this show will change my mind on that character. We'll give her a little bit more depth, a little bit more interesting of uh, not being such a one note character. But uh, the fact that they're continuing off Peacemaker with this, I did enjoy that show. Uh, it does make it seem like it is something that even if it's not high on my most anticipated list, I'll probably enjoy it. Coming in at number eight is going to be Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. And admittedly, this is mostly because I have no knowledge of the character of Supergirl. And I will discuss this later on in the video, but it has been a it's been a struggle for me to even become a Superman fan. I did not become a Superman fan until way late in life with the Henry Cavill version of that character. And so Supergirl is just an extension of that. The Kryptonians themselves, even as a kid, I was just never that intrigued by them. They always felt all powerful, uh, the ultra bright colors and hopeful stuff. I've always been drawn to the darker stuff like Batman. So this is purely out of ignorance of the character and the story. And so I have no knowledge of how awesome of a character she is. I just see the female version of Superman. So Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow says, taking its cues from the recent Tom King written miniseries, this movie promises a different take than what most think of when Superman's cousin comes to mind. We will see the difference between Superman, who was sent to Earth and raised by loving parents from the time he was an infant, versus Supergirl, raised on a rock, a chip off of Krypton, and who watched everyone around her die and be killed in terrible ways for the first 14 years of her life, and then come to Earth. Okay, remember what I said about being drawn to darker characters? <laughs> Apparently, I don't know shit. So yeah, that actually interests me. 
She is much more hardcore and not the Supergirl we're used to. Well, shit, now that I'm reading that, no, we're going to keep it at number eight. <laughs> and the Variety article basically said the exact same thing. No new information. So uh, I will say that does sound intriguing. I don't know if that is just a unique take on the character because they did say it's based off of a recent run of comics. So maybe that's just a recent version of Supergirl. But that does intrigue me because, yeah, that, that dichotomy of Golden Boy Superman and then this jaded cousin, that does bring some interesting things to be explored there so that does intrigue me more but i'm still going to keep it at number eight just because the ones above it i at least have some knowledge or some interest in what they're doing beyond just this one little tiny premise here but that does excite me so that's going to be coming after superman obviously uh and if they knock it out of the part with superman this will probably jump higher on the list significantly but then we got to see what Superman Legacy does. Coming in at number seven is going to be The Authority. And this, from what I have been led to understand, is essentially a group of superheroes that are a little more rough around the edges. They're a little bit more uh, outside of the law with how they do things, a little meaner, a little darker than your traditional group of superheroes. And it's because of that premise that I'm not as excited about that as maybe I would have been five years ago, because it just sounds like another variation of Suicide Squad and the boys. And don't get me wrong. I loved the Suicide Squad, the recent one. Uh, I really enjoy the boys, especially the last season. But we have so many of these evil superheroes. I mean, even Invincible was one that came out recently. We have so many of these darker variations of superheroes and superhero teams that it's almost becoming a cliche and it's becoming a little bit overexposed a little oversaturated for my taste and so this might be wildly different but it just sounds too similar to things that we've already gotten recently that's why i have it where i have it but nonetheless it says a movie based on a team of superheroes with rather extreme methods of protecting the planet the first originated in the late 1990s under an influential imprint known as wildstorm run by artist and now head of DC publishing, Jim Lee. One of the things of the DCEU is that it's not just a story of heroes and villains, said Gunn. Not every film and TV show is going to be about good guy versus bad guy. Giant things from the sky come and good guy wins. There are white hats, black hats, and gray hats, added Saffron. They are kind of like Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men. You can't handle the truth! They know that you want them on the wall, or at least they believe that. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, intriguing with the way that he brings in the Jack Nicholson thing to kind of color it. Uh, from global fame to relative obscurity, Superman Legacy will lead directly into The Authority, an ensemble movie about superhumans who have a less than idealistic approach to saving the world. Gunn spoke at some length about The Authority, a project he said he's really excited to bring to life. The characters from Wildstorm, which was launched in 1992, is an independent entity under current DC Comics chief Jim Lee and ultimately made an imprint of DC. The Wildstorm characters were later folded into the main DC Comics universe when the company rebooted its continuity with the New 52 initiative in 2011. Gunn said that he and Saffron intend to do the same with Wildstorm characters in the DCU. As a comic, the authority was created by Warren Ellis and Brian Hitch as an ends justify the means superhero team, an approach that appealed to Gunn and Saffron's desire to diversify the storytelling within the DCU. Uh, then he says the same exact quote about not just being heroes and villains. Um, Gunn said the film is being written now, but he declined to say who was the screenwriter. Okay. So yeah, it, it could be something really cool and interesting. Uh, I mean, even to a degree, just the Eternals that we got from Marvel, uh, two years ago was a movie that kind of dealt with the, the, the more nihilistic, more less than idealistic approach to saving the world. So it's just because I don't know, I haven't seen enough off of it now to get excited beyond all of the other variations of that same type of storytelling that we've gotten before. But it could very well change my mind, especially since they're saying that it's basically the second thing that we're going to see in this universe. So very integral piece to uh, kicking off this new universe. Coming in at number six is going to be Paradise Lost. And this is essentially their reboot, at least possibly. They didn't really say specifically, but they're their reboot of the Wonder Woman lore. This is a TV series that is going to be a prequel to Wonder Woman. It's all about Paradise Island or Themyscira. Uh, Gunn also described it as like Game of Thrones on Themyscira, which is what intrigued me more. This initially was lower on the list because 
I really love Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, and I love the version of Themyscira that we got. So that's actually one of the the losses that we're potentially getting with this new reset that hurt the most as much as I was not really a fan of 1984. And so I'm, I'm not as excited about going through the motions with that again. But what they have described here is the duo described this HBO Max series as Game of Thrones style drama set on the all female island that is Wonder Woman's birthplace. The mascara filled with political intrigue and scheming between power players. It takes place before the events of the Wonder Woman films. OK, well, I, it, I didn't hear him say that specifically in the video, so I don't know if they're just assuming that maybe this does keep Gal Gadot and uh, those movies as canon. Obviously, he described the Flash movie as a reset. So to a certain distant extent, all of the movies are still going to be canon, but that's another timeline. We'll see whenever we get the Flash film what exactly that looks like. Uh, so maybe it is a prequel. That would interest me more if it was actually going to be the same character as the same canonical story. Uh, you have Variety says Game of Thrones just story set on an island at the Mosquera before the birth of Diana. Um, how did that come about? What's the origin of an island of all women? What are the beautiful truths and the ugly truths behind all of that? And what's the scheming like between the different power players in that society? The provocative title recalls the Paradise Island Lost comic series authored by Phil Jimenez and George Perez, which followed a civil war on Themyscira. However, that run directly involved Wonder Woman. So it's right in the middle for me. And it's really going to depend on whether or not they announce that it is going to be canonically with the Wonder Woman films or if Gal Gadot is going to be able to come back at some point. I don't know. Uh, a hard reset on Wonder Woman. I'm not as excited about if it is canonical. I'm a little bit more intrigued by it, but it's the Game and Throne-ish story that they were kind of describing that does intrigue me a bit. Coming in at number five is Booster Gold. Now, this is a character that I had zero knowledge of, but just the little description of what his story actually is made me laugh. And so I'm actually really intrigued with what this might be. It's going to be an HBO Max series. Uh, presumably, he might show up in movies later on, but that's where he's getting his start. And it says an HBO Max series based on a unique, lesser known hero created in 86. Saffron said of the series, it's about a loser from the future who uses basic future technology to come back to today and pretend to be a superhero. Gunn described it as imposter syndrome as superhero. That sounds hilarious. <laughs> and so I've never read a single frame of Booster Gold, I've never really heard much about the character. But that sounds hilarious to me. I love time travel, so I don't know how much time travel is going to be an element in that aside from just the initial setup. But that sounds like there's a lot of potential great comedy in there. And if James Gunn has his hand in the writing whatsoever, I imagine he's going to knock it out of the park because he's always been a strong comedic writer. But that really does intrigue me just based off of the premise that that made it really high up on my list. Uh, now for Variety. Finally, there's Booster Gold, which allows the DCU to fully stretch into outright comedy. While he may not be familiar to casual fans of DC, the character, also known as Mike Carter, is a fan favorite among devoted readers. Saffron called Booster a uh, loser, yeah, same quote. In the 25th century, Mike is a disgraced former football star who uses a time machine on display in the Metropolis Space Museum. I'm laughing just reading the premise. Just I can imagine the pilot episode of this just being a fucking riot of this douchebag loser that gets a hold of some bullshit technology that is just outdated by their times and goes back to current times to be an awesome guy. That sounds hilarious to me. I almost regret not putting it a little bit higher, but yeah, that, that there's a lot of potential there. I, I need some dark comedy every once in a while. That sounds like that's going to be a recipe for success for me. Coming in at number four is going to be Swamp Thing, which is actually going to be a movie. I was surprised. You know, we got that attempt in CW that apparently was amazing and they canceled it after one episode. So I never bothered to watch it. Uh, the only experience with Swamp Thing that I have is the original Wes Craven film, which uh, if you haven't seen my Wes Craven ranking, I reviewed and ranked every single one of his films. Please check that out. I'll link that above. But it did not make it very high on that list. I was not a big fan of Wes Craven's take on Swamp Thing. There's a variation of reasons why, but it, it wasn't my thing. So not the best introduction to this character. But I've always loved the way that the character looked. And if you're going to fit horror into your comic book universe, you're going to get my attention. And the, um, James Gunn is somebody that is no stranger to horror. I mean, it's the guy that made Slither. Uh, he's all about dark, rated R, mean, bloody, gory type movies. That's kind of where he got his you know, early start in his career. And so I don't know. It's not going to be a part of the Elseworlds. It's going to be a part of the greater DCU. So I don't know how 
far it's going to go with its rating. But all they say is a horror film that promises to close out the first part of the first chapter. So the last movie in phase one and uh, Variety had a little bit more to say. Easily the most extreme example of Gone and Saffron's conviction to diversify the DCU, Swamp Thing will investigate the dark origins of Swamp Thing. By way of explaining further, Gunn referenced the initial reactions to the Guardians of the Galaxy joining the Marvel Cinematic Universe and initial questions about how Rocket Raccoon would work standing next to Thor. That mashup quality wound up being one of the highlights of Infinity War and Endgame, Gunn argued. Gunn said that they are one-upping that approach with Swamp Thing. This is a much more horrific film, but we'll still have Swamp Thing interact with the other characters. So purely because of my, my love for horror and my desire to get a little bit of that flavor in there and to have some of the darker, meaner, nastier stories take place in these universes, uh, and because I'm really intrigued to see this character finally done right <laughs> in a live-action format uh, and not get canceled after one episode, that I'm pretty intrigued with this one. Moving on to number three, we have our introduction to Batman and the rest of the Bat family in the DC universe, and that is going to be called The Brave and the Bold. And all that I have been taught about The Brave and the Bold is that it is a story about Batman and Robin, and it's being the Damian Wayne version of Robin, who is Bruce Wayne's son. Apparently, he's a bit of a psychopath, a little bit of a killer. And Bruce obviously trying to kind of tame that and let him use his his evil desires for good. And so there's elements of that that intrigues me. Uh, it honestly only makes it this high because I am a Batman whore and I have been wanting to see the Bat family in a, a new iteration since they completely fucked it up back in the 90s with Batman and Robin. Uh, and I really want to have a Batman where you can get the more fantastical side of that universe. I am all about the Matt Reeves Batman. Like I said, that would be number one by a landslide if I was including it on this list. And I love that dark, gritty, real world take. That's probably my preference for Batman. But one of the things that I was excited about with the uh, Ben Affleck iteration is that we were going to get things like Doomsday and Man Bat and Clayface and all these more out there villains that we've always just stuck to the kind of low level crime ones, you know, Joker and Penguin and Riddler. We always get kind of the grounded ones. I'm ready to start seeing the weird come into Batman. So that's what I'm hoping this is going to be. They don't say specifically if it's going to be that or if it's going to be another kind of gritty ground to take, but that's what I'm hoping this is going to be. And my hope is what brings it so high. So what they say is this is the introduction of the DCU Batman of Bruce Wayne and also introduces our favorite Robin Damian Wayne, who is a little son of a bitch. The movie will take inspiration from the now classic Batman run written by Grant Morrison that introduced Batman to a son he never knew existed, a murderous tween raised by assassins. It's a very strange father and son story. And importantly, it will feature a Batman not played by Robert Pattinson. However, oh, never mind. They're talking about the Batman sequel after that. So, yeah, I mean, that's to be expected. So we're going to have two different Batman going. I'm fine with that. I think that as long as they are completely different and they're not crossing the streams, that audiences will be perfectly fine and perfectly knowledgeable about what universe is what, especially with them using the Elseworlds banner that's going to become, I assume, a pretty big visual thing at the beginning of movies and with the advertisement. Uh, now, as far as variety, they say, along with introducing the DCU's version of Batman, who will exist separately from the version played by Pattinson in the Batman movies, the Brave and the Bold will introduce the Bat family, First among them is Robin, who is returning fully to live action movies for the first time since 97's ill-fated feature Batman and Robin. This version of Robin is Damian Wayne. Gunn described him as our favorite Robin, a little son of a bitch, an assassin, and a murderer. Damian is Bruce Wayne's biological son, a fact unknown to Wayne for the first eight to ten years of Damian's life. Strange father and son story. Project is based around, okay, so all the same information. So yeah, uh, I'm intrigued with it. I need to know a little bit more. This could have easily have been number one for me if I knew a little bit more from it. Um, but uh, that's what I'm hoping is that it's going to focus more on the bat family, bat girl, nightwing. Uh, and you're also going to have the fantastical villains. You know, Batman has so many characters and so, so such a huge, vast universe of awesome characters that you could almost do an entire cinematic universe just based off of Batman. So it's absolutely necessary that they have their own version of that character in this universe that's separate from Matt Reeves. Uh, but I'm just hoping it's going to be that side of things. If I find out that this is going to be another 
real world take on Batman and we're only going to have access to those real world villains, this is probably going to drop at least a couple of spots for me. Coming in at number two is going to be the kickoff for this new universe, and that is Superman Legacy, which is a new Superman film coming out in 2025, I believe they said, July 11th, 2025, right there. Uh, it's going to be written by James Gunn. And I would bet that he's probably going to direct it, too. They have not announced that. Maybe he's got so much on his plate he doesn't want to think about directing a film while kicking off this universe. But I have a hard time believing that a guy with that much passion for this character where he's going to write the film, make that the kickoff point, is not going to take full control and direct it himself. But we will see. Uh, and I'm excited for this because, as I kind of alluded to earlier talking about Supergirl, I have not been a bat or a Superman fan for very much of my life. As a kid, as a teenager, I just never cared for the character, was never interested. He always seemed like he had way too many powers, was way too powerful. I, just, I never felt the stakes of the character, never intrigued me until Man of Steel. And I genuinely love Man of Steel. I didn't love what they did with him afterwards. You know, I, there's certainly some issues that I have, even with the best cuts of Batman v Superman and Justice League. But unfortunately, that character was cut off before we really got to see him evolve and get his own standalone sequel. And so getting over the initial, you know, punch to the gut that Henry Cavill is not going to get to come back to this character, a, char a, a thing that he, sh he absolutely deserved. You know, it's not James Gunn or Saffron's fault. It is all the fault of the previous regime. But that guy was done the most dirty of anybody in this entire universe and handled it with class. So getting over that little gut punch, I'm very excited to see what Superman is going to be finally with a plan. With him being the figurehead of this universe, with him kicking it off, I'm sure they already have plans for sequels and team-up movies and all of that that he's going to be the forefront of. So having Superman back and kicking that off again, I'm excited to be there as a new Superman fan to see this new iteration. So they have it described as the movie featuring the Man of Steel that Gunn is writing and may direct, although no commitments on that end have been made. While the two previous titles are meant to be apertifs in Saffron's words, Superman is the true kickoff for the duo's DCU plans. It's not an origin story, Saffron said. Thank you, because I don't need another origin story. It focuses on Superman balancing his Kryptonian heritage with his human upbringing. He is the embodiment of truth, justice, and the American way. Right. He is kindness in a world that thinks that kindness is old fashioned. A release date of July 11th, 2025 has been penciled in. Uh, and then Variety set to open on July 11th, 2025. Superman Legacy will mark the start of the DCU. Uh, it focuses on uh, same thing. Gunn's writing the project. Saffron hoped that he can be persuaded perhaps to direct it as well. So if even Saffron wants him to direct it, pretty strong chance that's going to end up being the thing. Uh, Warner Brothers Discovery CEO Zaslav made no secret that rebooting Superman was a top priority for the company as he spent much of 2022 searching for the right leaders for DC Studios. So it was a little surprise Gunn and Saffron are turning to the most recognizable superhero in the world to lead the charge for the DCU. Is he, though? I got to be honest. I've always felt like Batman was more recognizable than Superman. I, I know everybody says Superman is like the most popular, the biggest superhero of them all, but I've always felt like Batman was more recognizable. Am I crazy? Let me know. Superman is for everyone, Gunn said. That's a four-quadrant film that should speak to everyone in the world. Yeah, so, I mean, there's not really anything else to comment on with that one. I just love the character of Superman, and I, I'm looking to make up for lost time with whatever this new iteration is. I'll be excited when they finally announce the casting. Probably a big announcement at Comic-Con, I would imagine, just having somebody come down in wires with a cape. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that one, as far as movies, is my most anticipated movie of these announced projects and finally number one for me is going to be lanterns which is an hbo max series based off of the green lantern core obviously this is a project that was announced a long time ago uh, a guy had been making that and then eventually they canceled it that was one of the projects that i had been anticipating for quite a while this is a totally new iteration of that but when you hear the words they use to describe their direction for the show, it shot all the way up to my number one, no question. Uh, Greg Berlanti's Long in the Works Green Lanterns TV series has been scrapped, and Gunn and Saffron have parted ways with the longtime DC series stewards. That's what I was talking about right there. In its place will be a new take on the Space Cops with Power Rings. Our vision for this is very much in the vein of true detective. Fuck yes, give it to me now. That is what excited me for this. 
It's terrestrial based. It will feature prominent lantern heroes, Hal Jordan and John Stewart. So it's like a buddy cop series and is one of the most important shows they have in development. This plays a really big role in leading into the main story we are telling across film and TV. So I would imagine whatever mystery, whatever thing that they are investigating is probably going to reveal whoever will be the main villain for this first chunk, this first phase of the DCEU. Uh, and so that's that's what I'm kind of reading into there. But having a buddy cop TV show with the Green Lantern Corps is kind of what I was expecting anyway. And that's a really intriguing premise to me, uh, especially when you get Hal Jordan and you have um, John Stewart, who are arguably the two most popular of the Green Lantern Corps. And those are going to be two very different characters, I'd imagine. A lot of potential for good back and forth there. I love a good buddy cop scenario. But saying that it's in the vein of True Detective, that really excites me because the first season of True Detective, I mean, that might be in the top five of greatest seasons of television ever made as far as I'm concerned. So if they're going for that tone or that approach, that really, really excites me, obviously leading all the way up to be number one. Uh, now, Variety says of all the TV series, Saffron and Gunn seem most excited for Lanterns, which Saffron described as a huge HBO quality event that is very much in the vein of True Detective. The show will focus on two of the best known members of the Green Lantern Corps, Hal Jordan, the test pilot first played on screen by Ryan Reynolds. Where's my thing? <laughs> and Jon Stewart, an ex-Marine and one of DC's first black superheroes who investigate a mystery that Saffron said plays a really big role leading in the main story. Very important show for us. This project is separate from a Green Lantern series that was being moved, uh, developed by Greg Belanti. Uh, Greg's vision was more of a space opera. Our vision is much more true detective, terrestrial-based investigation. Fuck yes. So I, I've said all I need to say about that. Like the Green Lantern Corps is a really, really interesting group of characters. Uh, I did not hate the Ryan Reynolds movie as much as everybody else, but it obviously was not a very good start for that character, and he's been struggling to get back to the big screen ever since. And so I think this is the right approach, having an HBO uh HBO quality event that they call it, which means big budget, uh, having it be this terrestrial space investigation thing uh, in the vein of True Detective. I mean, that does that sounds like something that I'm going to eat up. So that is absolutely the most anticipated, most excited thing that I have seen that was announced today. Please let me know down below what your guys' ranking of these announcements are. Do you have one that is way at the bottom of my list that I'm just totally not ready for how awesome it's going to be. Please, by all means, educate me. And is there anything that was not announced today that you're bummed out that you did not hear them announce or, or any kind of detail that you're really, really on the edge of your seat waiting for them to address maybe in phase two or the rest of phase one let me know all your thoughts down below in the comments guys and we will discuss it all right guys that's it for this one if you enjoyed this please click over here for all of my 2023 new release movie reviews and i'm also going to put my review of the batman up here if you just want to talk about some dc stuff please like and share this video hit that subscribe button so you don't miss anything in the future and as always remember opinions are like assholes but that doesn't mean you have to be